would know, like the purpose of Muse Entertainment, um, amongst the shows that they have on the air right now, are Bomb Girls and Human. And Trish Williams from uh, Bell Media, and she handles drama stuff, so that includes Save the Hope and The Listener and Motive. Various shows that have had success uh, both here and in the US. Um, so to start, we, we heard a lot, even if you're at the keynote this morning, Ladies, uh, or before that, the, the success that Canadian programming is having in the US market, um, and how I know for myself, I've been writing about TV for about three years of the post, and it seems like every year we're adding new series to the stable of this has gone to the States and it's done well. Um, it used to be a time where you'd say, Canadian television, and you sort of give it a skewed glance, uh, but it seems to me anyway, and there's lots of numbers to back this up, that there's been a lot more successes in recent years. So, I guess to open it up, I'll just ask uh, the panel that, with the successes we've had, or we the country, uh, have had in the States, um, do you think it's true that U.S. networks and broadcasters are more open now to Canadian television than they were in the past? I don't know if you want to do that. Well, it, it's interesting you, you asked me to start because, funnily enough, I've had quite a long history of working with American broadcasters, which began right back, hmm, here we go, <laughs> <laughs> like around 84, 85. Right. Um, they had TVs back then? <laughs> <laughs> no remote controls or anything. But, um, and we actually partnered with. Um, Degrassi, which we now call the Degrassi Classic Show, which was uh, Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High, we partnered with WGBH Boston right. and, uh, and with the CBC at home here. But the interesting thing, and it's sort of been a pattern for, as I've gone on with, with other shows over time, it's really great if you get, I find during the development process, you, you really need to find the heart of the series and, and maybe you do it with one broadcaster and you do it here at home. Um, so at least you have a sense of what the heartbeat of your show is before you start bringing in other partners. Because you do, you do have um, input from your partners. They are partners. We want to hear their input. We want the shows to be successful in, in, in both. But sometimes the visions can meander a little bit and, and as producers, it's like our job to, to understand the heartbeat of our show and keep a strong hand on the tiller so that it's, we're still making the show that we want to do, but at the same time, we're providing something that's going to keep both broadcasters happy. And that might be a couple of sim simple sentences to string together, but it is quite a monumental task to actually you know, make it happen. I, I basically, I think that Americans are looking for Canadian shows that have an American sensibility and seem American. So stuff that works for their mandate fits into their job. Right, it's that question of how, even if it's filmed in Canada, <laughs> can you make it Canada? Or will yeah. that like Alabama's not that into Dalton McGinley jokes. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, uh, you know, our experience is, is, has been, is somewhat like Linda's. You know, uh, getting productions that uh, have it, their own vision, having uh, uh, you know, creators and, and, and a, a writing room that knows where it's going uh, is extremely important. And we've had the experience of ha having writing rooms both in Canada and in the United States on shows that are being produced in Canada. And um, you know, uh, when the network is uh, it, it, ultimately, it's the old saying: "He who uh, pays the piper calls the tune." When the bulk of the money is coming from a Canadian network, then that Canadian network has not only the, the right, but the expectation uh, that their vision will be implemented. And obviously, they're looking at the producing team and the writing team to make sure that that is, in fact, the case. That's why they bought it in the first place. Um, conversely, uh, you know, when you're dealing with uh, a show that's been pre-sold for substantial dollars in the US and the Canadian sale is, is for whatever reason, the, the secondary element to that, then the notes that are going to be driving and the vision that's going to be driving that show is going to be coming from that network. Now, on the issue of Canadian stories versus uh, U.S. stories, we've had the, you know, the interesting experience of producing Bomb Girls, which is very clearly a Canadian show. It's set in Canada, it's identifiably in Canada, but 
it touches a theme that actually crosses borders because it's about you know women's uh, experiences in the 40s and how women came out of uh, what had been you know confinement to the household uh, to you know get their first jobs and we found that that theme uh, uh, believe it or not some American audiences actually get the theme and, and, and can look over you know the uniforms that say you know Canadian Army on it. Mm -hmm. Michael you that show specifically is an example of one that was produced you know for the domestic audience initially and then after the fact sold to the US if I'm, I'm correct. Well I mean it, it was sold to the yeah it was it was produced financed initially with the Canadian sale and then we sold it afterwards to the US before it was broadcast actually in Canada right. but we sold it to the US but it, it struck me as an example um, of a series that looked like it might have a hard time being sold because it was so intensely Canadian, but you found that, that the quality of the show was enough to carry it into, into the U.S. market. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the, the interesting thing is that it has found an audience in the U.S. Um, and um, has gotten some recognition in the U.S. So it's, it's uh, a reflection of what I was just saying before. I think that there's, there is you know, certainly uh, an openness to that kind of material. Look at how successful uh, some of the BBC shows have had, the experience that they've had. Look how Down Abbey performs in the U.S. It's, it's not U.S. content by any means. Trish, with, um, with Bell, you've, you've got series that have done it sort of different ways in terms of uh, bringing in the U.S. partner. Um, so whether it's Save Hope or Now Motive, mm -hmm. which was produced here first, well, it's now airing here first and will air later in the U.S., um, I assume that it, these are just different circumstances as each show comes out, you find a partner when you find a partner. Absolutely true. I mean, it, it, every show varies. There's <coughs> certainly no model really to follow. I mean, this is the first time, uh, certainly in, in my tenure, and I think the first time CTV ha or Bell Media has produced a show that um, we air in our own scheduling decision time slot and then airs later on a network in the U.S. Which is um, really rare. I've it's, actually it's never extreme. heard that before. No, no. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's great for us. I mean, it was a real win for us to be able to do that. Um, and for us, it sets a new precedent. You know, like that's possible. I mean, fingers crossed that everything goes really well. But, um, you know, ABC picked up the show because they watched it, they loved it, they thought it looks amazing, it's right for their audience. Um, so it's a win win, really. Um, and NBC Universal played a really big role, of course. I mean, they came on board very early in the in the process and were very involved. Um, you know, they, they, they Michael Edelstein sort of heads up NBCU from the UK, but he has um, a person in LA, Tom Cohen, who would fly up to Vancouver quite a lot throughout production. And you know, Corey and I would go to production. We were there the first week. We were there all the time as well. Tom was there also, so we got to know him quite well. We were often in the same story meetings together. Um, and it was interesting. I mean, you always worry, like, oh no, like he's going to have completely different views than us. They're going to try to drive it in a way that we won't like. And that just didn't happen. I mean, ultimately, his focus was the same as ours, which was just a good story, good characters, compelling turns. Like it's, you know, I know that sounds sort of generic, but it's true. It's just the universal, we want this story to be as good as possible. He got a little more obsessed with Thai choices than I did. I was surprised <laughs> yeah. at that. <laughs> but there wasn't like a, this is too much Vancouver, or there's, you know, this is, uh, because. I, I mean, I didn't encounter any, any feedback from NBC Universal, or I mean, ABC Now, they started to watch some of the final cuts. And right. I haven't experienced that. I mean, there's one example that um, one of the episodes takes place in Vancouver and Toronto. Um, the, the main character flies back and forth between the two. We found it a little bit confusing without supering where they were. Right. So on our version, it supered Vancouver, Toronto, and NBCU requested for it not to be supered. So, you know, our audience can see clearly it's Toronto here, Vancouver here, but the American audience won't see that. Um, staying with you, I visited the Saving Hope set a while ago before the first season aired and spoke to an actor. Um, this is with caveat that actors often say they know what's going on in the writing room, I'm told that they rarely do. Um, and he, his, he had told me that he was under the impression that because there was the two network model there, that there was a bit of, I don't want to say friction, but maybe a bit of tension between one network wanting the show to go one way and one network wanting to go the other way. I don't know if you could speak about that or whether that was true, um, but what was the experience with Saving Hope in terms of having the two networks? Um, 
You know, my experience of NBC on that show was quite limited in terms of um, the lovely woman from NBC came and we met at dinner. <laughs> um, she was super positive, excited about the show. I mean, ultimately, I think this is an interesting thing for us to discuss, is the way producers manage the relationship between two networks. Everyone has a different style of doing that. Um, you know, some, some producers like to kind of push you together to talk about your different points of view with each other. I mean, I don't prefer that. And I know Linda and I talked about this last night, and it, I could see the color in her face. <laughs> She's like, they did what? Oh my god, no, no, no. Um, I mean, it's, it's a very well-produced show, I think, when each network feels like they're being listened to, their notes are being addressed, they're getting what they want, and they don't hear about any conflict. And it's not something that's put on their plate to deal with. That's you know, what, and that, that's what happened on Saving Hope. I was completely unaware if there was any conflict or opposing positions or strife at all. And that's thanks to the, the producers, um, Alana Frank, David Wellington, and E1. Right. So I was, gonna, I was gonna just follow up to say, now that at the moment NBC isn't involved, that they're not, so that, I guess that doesn't really change things because you were saying it didn't really impact you when they were involved. No, I mean, I didn't hear any, any conflict whatsoever, and I mean, E1 has a person in LA who's very involved in the show. Um, last year it was Larry, and this year um, it's Deb Curtis, and she's involved in every notes call, I and mean, she's sort of looking at the show in terms of the US point of view, but I mean, she and I have had many calls, and we're totally on the same page about where the show needs to go, like, I mean, it's just, It'd be fun to say we had this throwdown, Matt. Like you know, we're fighting about, but it's just been very, um, very easy, really. I think there's a big problem historically in Canada with gratuitous Canadian content that people put into shows to try and unlock government money. Um, whereas you can do a show like in Kenny vs. Spenny, if there was Canadian cash or Tim Hortons, I would cut that out of the show. Um, so you know, the show is 100% American, but you know, we don't mention. Saskatchewan, the Great Cod Extinction, you know, it's, uh, to me, a show can be Canadian and, you know, still have an American sensibility. So, right. you know, I, I think people try to do shows that are honest. Um, in, in comedy, it's totally different because in comedy, um, Canadian comedies don't really, you know, aren't successful in Canada, whereas uh, SCTV, Kids in the Hall, Kenny vs. Spenny, Trailer Park Boys, uh, Tom Green, um, they're very unique shows that Canadians can actually make without emulating Canadian content. So those things work really well. But they're Canadian, but they don't, they don't stink of Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> um, with your experience with Comedy Central got involved with Kenny vs. Spanx sort of mid-run. Thank God. <laughs> Did, once, they, once you had a relationship with them and it was airing on that, channel, did that change what you were producing? Yeah, I actually tried to make it so fucking good that they wouldn't cancel it. Um, but you know what, you know, I work with Matt and Trey, and you know, these are, you know, these guys are so incredible that they actually, you know, do Canadian content in their American show, and they make right. it work. Like, you know, who else can actually do Canada jokes that work in the U.S., and they've managed to bamboozle that as, you know, a large form of their content. Um, but no, you know, the reality is, my experience, I'll be truthful, and it may sound shitty, but, you know, um, my experience with Americans is they just don't care about Canada. They, they really just want the show to be as, as incredible as possible for their channel. So um, I've, I found that my broadcasters usually got schlucked aside and were, you know, well, extremely, you know, the reality is Canadians want to work with, with Americans. You know, so, and I, I think a lot of Canadians should, you know, America does it better than us, you know. Seinfeld's better than uh, Jerry D, you know, I hate to say it, but it actually is. And, and I think we can learn a lot from the American system. And, you know, the more we emulate Hollywood, not, you know, not in a, not trying to, like, you know, be them. Um, you know, I, I just think America's a profit-motivated system, Canada's a culturally-motivated system, and the more profit-motivated we are, the better our content's going to be. 
Well, I mean, I, I, I take a bit of issue with that. Uh, <laughs> well, that's why you have a, that's why your show's uh, on TV and mine's not. <laughs> well, I, 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 firstly, I think that Canadians are very profit-oriented. Um, I, I think that Canadians are looking to try to, uh, uh, you know, have success in the programs that they're doing. Yeah, there's a I think renaissance there's a, now. I uh, it, it, it's been going on for quite a few years. Linda's been doing it for 25 years. 35, actually. But <laughs> 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 sorry, I apologize. Sorry, but Linda's very, uh, very uh, rare. Like, Lin, like Linda's honestly. very rare. Very rare. But um, the truth is that the uh, if you look over the landscape of what's been going on in Canada over the last few years especially, but it goes back a bit of time, um, you know, the, the Canadians do get the idea that their shows, Canadian producers get the idea that their shows have to work across borders. They have to work for audiences everywhere, and they have to have the kind of quality that's going to keep people coming back. And guess what? Canadian audiences like American television too. And if you want to get more than Canadian, Canadian, more than Canadian. Well, uh, well, the, the point is, if you want to get a Canadian audience to watch your sh Canadian show, it better be as good as the American show that's coming across the border, or you're not going to get an audience. Mm. And the the remarkable thing that's happened in my mind in the last few years, and I've been involved in this industry at least for more than 35 years, um, the uh, it has been that you know Canadian producers and Canadian talent has really come, brought the bar up in the last few years to. Uh, be able to show shows like you know Flashpoint or Saving Hope, where the, you know Canadian audiences will watch those shows not because they're Canadian, not because they want to wave the flag, but because they like the show, and and that's what we have to do. I'm, ta well, I'm talking comedy though. Yeah. The drama genres, you guys have been crushing it. Congratulations, honestly. <laughs> in terms of comedy, there are very uh, a handful of shows that have migrated to the U.S. And I want to pick up on the, something Michael said earlier particularly in the area of drama, it is those universal themes. And like that's that's what I think is giving Degrassi its longevity because the that whole business of being a child, becoming an adult, it really crosses borders and we've been able, because of those universal themes, we've been able to cross the borders without compromising our Canadian content. And like we're very we don't hide Toronto and whatnot. Now the majority of our show takes place in a school and takes place in kids' homes which is all a very universal kind of um, experience. But we, we do nothing. We name our schools after Canadian names. If we've got people coming, they come from Banting or wherever to play with the Degrassi teams. And what was interesting, our American broadcaster ran a focus group in the States to say, where do you think the show is shot? And the Americans said, oh, um, they were divided. And they felt that it was shot in California or in Florida. And the reason they said that was because the weather's always good on Degrassi. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they were not hung up. We use Canadian money when we when we use money. We don't we don't hide it. We don't do a close up of it. But um, I think if I think if you've got your universal themes, um, and the the interesting thing, picking up on what Trish was saying about notes, sometimes I will be in my office and my writers will walk into my office and say, Oh my God, we're so screwed. I, we cannot deal with these notes. And you'll have a note maybe you know, from your one broadcaster, from your other broadcaster, and at certain points in the script, it sounds like they're completely at odds with one another. And you know, maybe they'll say like, oh, in scene 15, like this guy, like he's not really doing very much. Like why doesn't he make a play for the girl that he's always wanted? And the other note might be, oh my god, why doesn't this guy do the most noble thing and walk away? And so, the thing I always say to my writers is, let's just stop for a moment, because we do know that both broadcasters want a successful show. They want it to work for their audience. So the interesting thing is they both glitched on scene 15. So something is not working right in scene 15. And when we look at it, you know what? It's not clear what that character is thinking, what the choices they're making, and the character is coming across as passive. So they're asking, both of them are asking for the character to do something. They might be asking it, it like sounds why, why does different. he have to tap maple syrup trees? <laughs> 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 but, you, but you understand what I'm saying? It, it, it might sound like the broadcaster is asking for something different, but really what they're saying is, we don't, we're not connecting with this character at this point. We're not understanding their motivation. There's not enough clarity. And those are the points that I encourage the writers to go back with. And it's not to try and please the broadcaster on the individual 
um, note that they have asked for, perhaps, but it is to get to the fundamentals of that. And I think that the, a good producer, that's how you have to manage when you've got what sometimes feels to be conflicting notes from two different broadcasters. Yeah, but you know what, can Canadiana actually works, like there's unique hints of Canadiana works, work in shows in, in America, and that's why I think, um, you know, Canadian comedy is so original that certain shows do, you know, go to the U.S. And, and your show, you know, you know, it had, it, 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 you know, it, the, the Canadiana actually worked in it, that Americans could relate to the content. And um, like and I said, I'm talking comedy, so right. it's very, and, and very you know, Can Canadian politics, it's hard to sell a, a show about Canadian politics in, in America, but, you know, our stuff's so weird and absurd, and, you know, we're, we actually do British comedy with an American accent, so, you know, our unique view of humor, when it's done right, oh, not specifically done right, but when it works in America, being Canadian totally helps. Look, Canadians are running American content in Canada. You know, they write everything. So... Kenny, were there um, parts, I mean, once you've, once you've established a relationship with a U.S. broadcaster, um, did you find that there were issues in terms of what you could say, what you couldn't say, that kind of stuff that, that might come up? Um, well, Canada is totally allowed more sexual content, more deviousness, and uh, Americans are allowed to be more politically incorrect because we're so conservative. <laughs> so, you know, my major issues were, at least I'm not, uh, my, I had the best, you know, my broadcasters are so fucking good, it's incredible. Like, they let us, they let me dose my friend with acid on national television. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Americans are watching our show going, oh my God, what the hell is this? But, um, so here, you know, here, uh, our S&P is a lot different. You know, we're, we're, you know, here they, they, they really do nurture people and allow you to, to do things that no other country would, you know, it's, it's strange. We're like Dutch, we're like a weird Dutch network, you know. We can do, you know Norwegian TV, we can do these incredible things that no one else um, is allowed to do. But, you know, most of my productions, and I've done three, have been acquisitions. So when you have something that's, Defined, and you give them a show that they like, then you know, thank God they kind of hang back. But I, I did a show on FX, and every fucking line we did on every single script was so nitpicked. It was just, it was, it was horrible to deal with the American executives. Linda, your shows are up for a couple of Glad awards, um, specifically relating to same sex kisses. Glad, glad kitchen catchers? <laughs> uh, the man from Lesbian Glad. Association or something, something. Um, but in dealing with same scenes that involve same sex relationships. So, was there an issue between you know, putting that in front of an American audience? That I think we like to think that in Canada we're more open to such things. And it's true. Okay. It, it, like there is a more um, openness when we pitched. I think it was season ten of the current Degrassi. When we <coughs> what was it? Se season seventy two, I think. <laughs> <laughs> season ten. <laughs> <laughs> And that was three years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well, we pitched that we were going to have a um, transgender character. We wanted to have a um, young male who was trapped in a female body. And um, certainly there was much more willingness on the, the Canadian side to embrace this. The Americans were intrigued by it, but weren't, you know, too sure. And what was really great was we had been nominated for a, an Emmy and we met Chaz Bono there and Chaz Bono was so excited by what we were doing and then wanted to come and do a guest appearance in the show and somehow that became, it, it validated it for, for the Americans. But the, I think the, the topic, and it's interesting because it's repeated itself for me, the topic that's given me the most trouble on Degrassi, the other side of the border, is abortion. And um, in the original Degrassi, when we did a show on abortion, we took our young girl right up to the clinic. She had to walk through protesters, and she got to the other side, was clearly going in, was clearly going to have the abortion. The only, <coughs> the only episode of all 70 of the, the classic show that I had to cut a different ending for was that episode, and we had to leave her on the other side of the protesters so that we didn't know if she was going to go through with the abortion or not. When we, like, flash forward, it was, you know, about 14 years later, we we're tackling the same subject on Degrassi, The Next Generation, and we didn't have to recut the show 
but they were very, very nervous about it. And again, we had a young girl, and the final scene of it was she was with her mother in the waiting room, and she was going to go in. She was definitely going to go through with the abortion. And when they saw the cut, and it was reflective of the script, they asked for, well, do you have a close-up of her face that is remorseful? And we said, no, because the whole point is she's gone through this thought process. She's doing it. This is the right choice for her. And it was very disconcerting to them. Now, it was never in the script that she would be remorseful. But when it got you know, to standards and practices and the like, and they right. saw it, they thought, oh, you know, we, it, it, she can make that choice, but she must be remorseful. And um, we didn't have the material. And eventually, that show went on air. It, did, it was delayed for a while. But that has been the biggest hot button issue that we've had to deal with with different sensibilities across the border. And is that specifically something where you're told, um, you know, that they just don't want to risk a boycott or American Family Association or somebody coming down on them? Or is it that their own um, sensitivities around the subject? They're scared of losing their jobs. <laughs> and, and losing their audience um, and losing their advertisers. Um, we had a huge pro protest from the Florida Family Association because of the gay and transgender storylines that we've been running. And you know, they accuse us of we're turning young people to be gay, and it's just like, you know, we're just propaganda. And they ran a big campaign to try and get our advertisers to withdraw their advertising from Team Nick. And fortunately, they, they weren't successful. But yes, those people are out there. Yeah. And I can totally back that up, because I've dated three cast members from Degrassi, and they <laughs> all have <laughs> <laughs> Um, Michael, you speaking of protests and boycotts and yeah. such things, when when you produced the Kennedy's miniseries a couple of years back, obviously yeah. that was one where I, I'm sure you had no inkling that this was going to become a thing, but all of a sudden, I think you and I spoke for a piece around the time, but um, for those of you that don't remember the controversy, the Kennedys ended up getting, it was supposed to be history in the U.S.'s first scripted uh, programming, and they ended up dropping it because, primarily because of a boycott um, of people who thought it wasn't a fair portrayal of the Kennedys. So, uh, obviously, that didn't cause any trouble in the domestic market, it still aired where it was intended to air, but um, what was your sort of experience there where all of a sudden you realized that this was something that was not going to just go away? Well, uh, it, first, it, it wasn't boycotted in the United States. It right. dropped. Right. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but the good news was that it got picked up elsewhere, as, yes. as everybody knows. The, the, the experience uh, was, had nothing to do, obviously, with, with a Canadian-U.S. conflict. Right. This, this had to do with internal U.S. politics that we were dealing with. And uh, the fact, and, and we, we certainly uh, learned um, a, a tremendous amount that we uh, didn't necessarily want to know about um, you know the sensitivities in the U.S. from you know particularly powerful groups to uh, you know their stories being told uh, the way uh, uh, on television the way that was be being uh, you know powerfully communicated uh, that um, may have had some impact on their self-image. Um, and uh, you know, it, it, it's it, it, was, it was. I mean, if, if I took anything away from that, it, it's that the way the game of politics and, and media is played in the United States is a, a lot more vicious and a lot uh, tougher than it is in this country. And um, you know, in terms of you know uh, political correctness, uh, you know, they, they they don't have it there. There's 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 a very you know, if, if you've got a, a point of view. That you want to express, you'll use whatever means you can to get that point of view expressed. You know, uh, in terms of you know defending the material that we produced and how uh, we came upon the stories, I don't think I need to do it in front of this audience. Um, I think that we've got uh, you know lots of evidence, including you know ten Emmy nominations, to prove that you know the material was in fact uh, accurate and valid. But um, the, uh, the, the there is clearly. Uh, a very uh, you know different attitude that can get expressed uh, you know down there than we've seen here, and we so we live that in, in, in our experience. Of course, we've had examples in Canada uh, going back in time. You know, people will remember the uh, the the, uh, I don't, uh, the the docudrama that Brian McKenna produced about the uh, about Bomber Harris and the, the bombing campaign of World War II pilots in 
in, in, uh, in and, and there were Canadians, and there was a you know major protests that were raised in uh, Parliament by uh, through the pressure that was brought to bear by uh, veterans of World War II, and um, you know it was interesting if you think back on it, the amount of grief and misery. I think uh, Arnie Gelbert was involved in that project. I thought Arnie might be in this room somewhere. Uh, that uh, that was brought to bear on uh, on the Canadian producers and the, the amount of time they had to spend uh, defending uh, things. So it's we're not immune from that kind of political pressure. Attack, right? and, and my my friend owns Yuck Yuck Smart Breslin, and he's been working with Americans and Canadians and traveling the world and doing comedy for years. And he said that you know Americans just don't like it when you shit on the rainbow. And so they're really, I mean, for us, we're, you know, we're such an objective viewer of American culture that it's so easy for us to be cynical or, or you know, show them exactly what they're doing. You have to be really careful about crapping on their system because they really do not like it. Mm -hmm. you know? The funny thing with the Kennedys example, too, is I remember when you and I spoke, we, it wasn't like, I mean, it doesn't really come as a shock to anybody that the Kennedys had some uh, secrets. Well, they weren't even secrets. I guess that's the point. Like, this is not a in a sense, that it's a great big revelatory thing that there was some, uh, you know, improper behavior going on behind the scenes. So, but they seem to believe, or not they, the, the people who were protesting and ultimately pressured history into dropping it, were saying things like that this was a Republican engineered, you know, hit job, which was, I mean, your well, ties, I'm, your I'm ties. A, I'm a card carrying liberal. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> your, your ties to the Republican Party are not very obvious. So. Um, that whole part of the discussion was just so odd as a you know third party observer. But having said that, would you you know if somebody approached you to do a, a Bush's mini series now, would you look at it and say this is just not going to be worth the trouble? Well, um, you know we're, we're, the truth is we're actually produced, developing, and, and hopefully producing a sequel to the Kennedys right now. So uh -huh. uh, maybe that answers your well, question you in terms not, of my, not, not my will. But I'm not, we're not we're not going to get scared yeah. off. Uh, by that kind of experience, but on the other hand, we're not going to get you know a big license from the History Channel, right? Uh, so uh, that's that. Was, there's certainly a price to be paid, and you know it does come back down to that point of you know he who pays the piper calls the tune, and uh, you know we, we we all spend our lives as producers trying to sell our shows, trying to you know convince broadcasters to get behind our shows, and um, it, it, there's no question that there's. A, a chill effect that's imposed upon broadcasters when they hear stories like that, uh, and you know they're worried that they might lose, you know, advertisers, they might lose audience, they might lose credibility, um, and um, there's some subjects that broadcasters just won't touch. Oh, there goes my John A. McDonald idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's already been done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Trish, with with a show like Motive, which. It doesn't deal with political issues, stuff like that, but um, have there been any concerns with whether there's a particular episode, there they deal with murders, obviously, that's the point of it, um, with subject matter that might be okay for Canadian audience and might be a bit dodgier in, in the U.S.? Uh, well, nothing has come up specifically on that show other than the general observation that was already made here that um, for S&P, um, Canadians are more lenient when it comes to sexual content and we're actually much more strict when it comes to violence. We don't like to see violence, we don't like to see unnecessary violence. If there is violence on screen, it needs to be defensible, it needs to be very important for the story, it can't be excessive. That's something that's actually come up quite a bit on motive in terms of dealing with the cuts, and I work very closely with the person at CTV who reviews that, because she needs to be able to defend it and say, we felt it was valuable for the storytelling and it was important and there are lots of examples of where we've cut back significantly on the amount of violence that you see on screen because it wasn't defensible where she says because we work on a lot of shows with Americans and at one point our producer says said actually after ABC got involved that she said well Disney is okay with that scene and she was like well that's because Americans will allow a lot more violence on TV than we will that's fucking goofy <laughs> <laughs> makes sense though that's right swearing. Yeah. well look I mean, the States Tarantino wins an Oscar like they, they love violence it's a violent culture but I mean to that point as well I've actually had the opposite um, experience working on a show called, called Orphan Black that we're doing for space on our side and BBC America is the broadcaster in the US and um, they've actually uh, been very sensitive um, when guns were used on that show and that was actually specifically after the Sandy Hook shooting um, 
it, it just, I mean, it caused an uproar, of course, everywhere, and increased sensitivities everywhere. But the debate going on in the U.S. in regards to gun control had a significant effect on the way they commented on gun use in that show. We had a similar, um, it was interesting because right around that time, we had um, an episode where one of our young girls is living alone and she's being scared, so she actually does, through illicit means, buy herself a gun. Ultimately, it was a story against guns um, because it, it turned out very, very badly for her, but um, it was due to air in the States just quite soon after the Sandy Hook, and there was some a lot of discussion about whether it should actually air or not. And it was very interesting because the young woman who was in that role was in New York, and we said, um, "Listen, she's in New York. She's available to do publicity. Um, you know, would you like? Would you like? Her? No, 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 no publicity." And we said, "We don't. She doesn't have to talk about the guns or whatnot. Can we? She can just do publicity about Degrassi." And there was just such, such a tightening, such a. Uh, you could, it was palpable, you could feel it. And uh, I mean, eventually they, they, they did air the, the, the gun issue. The, me the message of it is very much an anti-gun message, but just the very fact that there was a gun and it was in a school was, was very difficult for them at that time. Um, before I continue, does, if anyone else says in the audience would like to ask a question, you feel free to jump in or just raise your hand at some point, give me a wave and I'll cut myself off and ask one. Um, uh, having said that, uh, I, I wanted to ask you specifically, Linda, about the LA Complex, which is a show that was very much developed with the Canadian market in mind, um, ended up on a US broadcaster as well, and it seems, I mean, if you're comparing that and Degrassi, LA Complex seems a lot less Canadian uh, because it's set in LA, um, and yet it didn't end up having the long run that Degrassi did. So, do you think there's any lessons to be drawn from that? Lessons? <laughs> I don't know about lessons. I mean, the thing about a television show, it's it's like trying to capture lightning in a bottle. Like there, some of times it will be magic and it will work, and you'll have longevity. Other times you put all the same ingredients, you put all the passion, you throw all the right people at it, and it just. It, it just doesn't have the same magic at the end of the day. Now, I thought L.A. Complex was incredibly magical. I loved that show. I loved producing it. Looked I, amazing. I loved working with Mark Tight stories. It, it, it had a clip and a yeah. pace to it. Um, it was interesting because we were able to, to set it in L.A., but it was about young Canadians trying to make it in L.A., so it was able to be Canadian without having to be set in, in Canada. I was so proud of our production teams who made, like we shot most of it in Toronto, yeah. but we built a swimming pool, we built the complex, which yeah. you saw, um, but we just didn't get, we just didn't get the traction, we didn't get the numbers, and um, it, it was very interesting for us because CW, we started with um, CTV, who were great, then CW came in, and um, we were forging a really great relationship with them on neither broadcaster did we get the numbers that we had hoped. The interesting thing about it was though, we got incredible digital activity. And there's, there was no real way of measuring that. I, I was lecturing at Ryerson, and there was about 100 kids in the class, and they were all saying to me, where's the LA complex? And I said, well, I, this was before we knew we weren't going on season three. And um, I said, well, it's been on air. And they said, we don't watch on air. Like, but it was just like a foreign thought to all these 100 young people. And they were frustrated because they weren't being able to find it. And the CW did actually pick us up for a third season because they, they were hoping that we could get more traction in the, in the digital um, world, even though our numbers were low. Um, and it was, you know, like Chris, Chris and I were, were heartbroken that we couldn't get it going yeah. again because we all love that. I know, show. look, if digital content mattered in Canada, my butler would be driving a Bentley right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they don't care. Okay, yeah. and even Americans are scared of digital, but it's all starting to change. Well, the, the, the way people are watching television, um, and I shouldn't even use the word television, I use it, you know, more generically, it's, it's so drastic. and. Um, we have to find, I mean, I think they are starting to measure some of that digital activity now, which is, which is really critical. 
So we were just, you know, a show, a great show with great people, and, you know, perhaps the timing just wasn't right. Who knows what all those... You got it on the air. It yep. aired. Shows get canceled. What can you do? Yep. Sometimes it works, sometimes it works. Um, given that some of the... I mean, I guess there's, there's challenges that can be overcome with dealing with the U.S. as a market. Um, are there other scenarios whereby a show can be developed in Canada and then sold internationally to a bunch of different territories and where you don't even necessarily need to worry about whether the U.S. is on board or not. I don't know. It's called E1. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, no, we've certainly done that as well. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a model that, uh, you know, often starts with um, European elements right. that, that come to us or, or, or we go to. Uh, you know, and there's certainly uh, an economic model that may make more sense in the future, uh, where whereby the U.S. is simply an aftermarket, uh, and and the, the the driving forces are the Europeans and the, and the Canadians. Um, and I just want to say, look, you do a you do a really good show that's great that people like, and it goes places, and people watch it. You know, that's how you sell the show in the U.S. That's how you that's how you get executives to not you know crap all over your stuff. You give them incredible stuff. You don't have shitty actors in there or shitty writers. You have great directors, and, and you, you have great stories, and your stuff will go, and you'll make tons of cash, and you'll do really well. That's how shows work <laughs> off anywhere. So <laughs> not <laughs> shady. <laughs> not shady. <laughs> All right, everyone, shady. Right that down. Avoid the shittiness. <laughs> well, I don't see anyone writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on, on an, the international co-production, uh, Pillars of the Earth yeah. was one like that. Where, but in, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but I re seem to recall that that was all known ahead of time as well, like the germ and, and Hungary. And all well, I mean, the, 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 the important point about Pillars of the Earth is that it was completely financed, and, and I'd like to emphasize the fact that we did the financing just around the crash of the stock markets in 2008. Right. Um, that uh, without a, a pre-sale. To any English language market other than Canada, right. um, and uh, we were able to eventually sell it in the U.S. and in Britain uh, and in Australia. So um, that kind of thing can work. It's like lightning in the bottle, as, as Linda says. It doesn't. It's, it's, it's not. It's not your preferred model to start with. But we were blessed in that case with having a very, very substantial title that sold was a, a huge bestseller book in Germany and in Spain. And uh, which had um, you know a pre-sale in Germany that rivaled anything we could have gotten out of the United States. I remember I interviewed Gordon Pinsett around the time that that launched, and and I asked him because there was this international cast, and I said, I assume you're in here because of the Canadian market, and he said, actually, the Germans wanted me. <laughs> <laughs> and but which I don't know if, which he said like he just he was well known. He was you know a, a kind of guy that had the gravitas to pull off a that kind of a role, but it's interesting that even there, I guess you do get into questions of you've got pre-sales to international markets and they might have different expectations or desires for how the show ultimately is crafted. Well, I mean, I, 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 one of the things I love about our business is, is the international aspect of it and uh, the, the opportunity that you get uh, as you're traveling the world, uh, you know, we, we produce, co-produce and sell um, uh, around the world. Um, uh, and you appreciate the different cultural sensibilities that people have in different countries. Uh, one of the ones that um, I like to tell most, and this is a, an older story, we, we did a series about 15 years ago, or 12 years ago, uh, called The Never Ending Story, which was based on the, the German book of the same title and the, the film title of the same title. And it was a, it was a children's oriented program. It was done with some fantastic special effects, and, and, and it was a really a high-end uh, uh, kind of program. Um, and uh, we were delighted at that time, especially at that time, because we had um, a Chinese buyer that was very interested in, in picking up the show, which was very, very rare at the time. And um, we um, had to, of course, submit it to the Chinese censor board to find out you know, that it could be put on the air in China. And um, you know, this is a kid's show. It's, it's about uh, a, uh, a, you know, a, a young boy who magically falls into a book, uh, learns uh, about a wonderful world that he can travel to through the book. It's about his imagination. He's helped by a magician, a wizard, who helps him get to this place. And um, we, we failed the uh, test of the uh, Chinese censor board 
not because we were violent, not because we had dirty language, not because we had nudity, but because we had a wizard. Oh. I thought it's because they, they ate all the animals in it. <laughs> because, because the Chinese government at the time, and maybe still, I don't know, uh, was frowned upon the idea of magic. It was. So Harry Potter is not big in China. Harry Potter not big. In China. <laughs> <laughs> is it, I don't know about Harry Potter, but uh, that that's what we, we experienced in that show. Wizard oh. censorship. Yes. <laughs> it makes me wonder how Degrassi ever got on in China. Yon can cook killed it. I had a very interesting experience where friends of my family were um, were visiting in China, and they had a, were given their interpreter who was going to be their tour guide and had assumed that they were um, American. And when they said, no, we're uh, Canadian, they said, ah, Bethune Degrassi. It <laughs> <laughs> was a lovely story. Did you, did you ask him about Kenny versus Spanish? <laughs> <laughs> that was third. Yeah. Um, Trish, so Bell now has announced a bunch of, you've got a couple of sitcoms in, in the production phase. Um, Will your approach to them be any different, like with the eye of, of a U.S. sale, or, or is there anything you can do on the, you know, these are more t traditional sitcoms as opposed to what Kenny does, but I'm curious if, if you have thoughts. I've done a sitcom. <laughs> IMDb me. <laughs> but I'm wondering if you have thoughts about trying to export those, or not export, but you know, do a U.S. deal with those two. I mean, comedy isn't my arena, so right. I mean, I'm sort of at a remove from most of the discussions going on about that. I mean. All I know is that we want to make the best stuff possible and make sure that it gets financed at a level that everybody's happy with so it looks really good and is successful and, you know, make sales wherever it's possible. So, sorry, I can't be more yeah, specific I don't know. Can, we, Have we ever done a multi-camera sitcom in Canada? Like, ever? Can any, like, well, there's one other one going on right now, aside from Spun Out, that was just announced. Really Two, well, there's uh, Mr. Young, Mr. Young and, and Package Deal. Oh, package deal. Yeah, right. But I mean, package, package deal has a package deal hasn't aired yet, so we don't know. <coughs> but, but they're multi camera. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh my God, incredible. But Mr. Young is more of it's not uh, it's a more teen or, or it's a no. younger oriented show as opposed to you know trying to do a Canadian version of the Big Bang Theory. Yeah. Kind of thing, so. well, spun out, spun out is multi camera. Right? That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, we do a lot of Canadian versions of things. You know, it's hard to do. <laughs> See, when CSI is getting three million dollars an episode, it's hard to. You know, have do CSI in Canada for 500 or a million an episode. It's just, you know, right. It's tough, tough to emulate their content. Um, having said that, one of the things that they touched, well, that was mentioned in the early discussion um, today, was that we have now seen a bunch of networks go with like Canadian versions of U.S. franchises, whether it's Amazing Race Canada or Big Brother Canada, that kind of stuff. But does this group here think that you can still avoid that kind of, we have to go with some U.S. known brand to be successful there? I mean, it sort of gets back to the earlier question of... Well, acquisitions and formats are running global broadcasting now. If it works and it's a good idea and you can get people to watch it and you can sell McCain pizza pockets, great. We should do it. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, I think there's a little, you know, I think they've adapted our formats, we've adapted their formats. Why not do it? If it works, people like it. I mean, I, I agree. It's, it, I mean, and it, it depends on the specific format, right? Like, if it's a fit for Canada, it makes sense. Um, you know, Amazing Race makes sense because we've got this amazing, huge country that people are fascinated by, the landscape. You want to see people trying to go in a challenging way from place to place. Like, I thought it was so exciting that we're going to be doing that with, you know, just the geography of our country. Canadians are fascinated by their country's geography, so it's the perfect fit. Yeah. But that Bachelor worked. Big Brother's actually not that bad. People yeah. are fascinated by Canadian men. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but formats, the format business is, has become a, an international business. It, it, it's not particular to formats that come from the U.S. or come from Canada. They, they come from Norway. They come from uh, Israel. They come from France. Uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, what certainly has happened, and I think you, you, you experience this when you talk to, uh, you know, a lot of the networks in the U.S., that, that people are very, uh, are network buyers want proven uh, formulas, things that have worked somewhere else. And if it's worked somewhere else, they, act, they say to themselves, well, it could work here too. Yeah. And uh, that's, you know, a good thing and a bad thing because, you know, it, it, it does stifle, uh, you know, uh, creativity and, and imagination. Yeah, but it's tough. You bring American Idol here, 
and you have girls on stage doing Inuit throat songs, it doesn't really, it doesn't work, and it dies, you know. So well, yeah, hard American, to say. Just keep in mind, American Idol was a was a was a format that they bought. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's a major. Um, Trish, I, we didn't touch on The Listener, which is another CTV drama that has had a U.S. broadcaster and doesn't now, I believe, at the moment. It actually does. I mean, Listener is a great example of one of those shows that, you know, initially it was, um, you know, it was greenlit by CTV and then NBC picked it up, but then it didn't work for NBC's schedule and everyone was like, oh no, this is the end of it. And of course it wasn't. I mean, Fox International really stepped up, supported the show. They were confident that they would be able to, you know, make sales and indeed they did. And now Listener is airing on ION in the U.S. And that was a very successful partnership for that show. It's still going strong. And so that was a case where you had NBC attached, but it didn't work out, and that didn't end up being the, the end of it. No, absolutely not. I mean, the show still does extremely well for us. And ION's very happy with it as well. We, and, I mean, ION came on board the last two seasons of, of Flashpoint as well, and, you know, it's just, it's an, these players sort of pop up, um, you know, they weren't around previously, they got into doing originals, and Flashpoint was a nice option for them, and the listener too, in terms of proven content. They could see what it was that they were buying, they knew uh, sort of the, the type of audience that it attracted, they knew that it was doing well in Canada, um, so that it would you know, continue to go for, for, well, you know, how long they go is always a little bit of a question mark, but um, you know, when they've got a proven track record, it's a better bet for you know, a, a, a smaller, um, Cable caster like Ion, who has to be very careful. Yeah, I think people are making, starting to make really incredible shows here, and I think the market's going to friggin' explode over the next five years. But we <coughs> give American shows that they can air, and ca Canadians will pay a big chunk of it. I'm telling you, Art, I, I, I just <laughs> think it's a, an entirely new renaissance of Canadian programming now. It only really makes sense that the <laughs> that if there are pressures on the Canadian broadcasters here to spread the cost of it, that. The American broadcasters have the same problems that you have here. They're having their absolutely funding and stuff like that. So, uh, does anyone have questions about? I've seen anyone? Raise I do have a girlfriend, so <laughs> hands down. Well, the last thing I want to ask, down, <laughs> the last thing I want to ask before we wrap up then is a, a lot of the successes have come with shows that have that have done summer scheduled runs in the in the U.S. Um, do we think that they? Is it, would it be a good thing, or maybe it would be too much pressure if they, if a show was picked up for like a fall run in, you know, on a major U.S. network? Would be a lot of pressure. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll let you. I'll let, no, I'll, no, no, you. Me? Well, we're we're blessed with the fact that Trish over here has supported us on a show called Play, which we're just about to start producing with Back Alley, um, and that uh, will be going on the air this fall on Canadian Prime Time. Without being a summer, uh, you know, simulcast. Mm -hmm. God knows we're we're getting into, but we're doing it together. Yeah, and Motive also premiered in the um, mid-season. Yes. Without a simulcast, um, so I mean, our perspective at Bell Media and CTV is that we don't always want our shows to be in the summer. I mean, obviously, we have to be strategic about programming and look for shows across all of the you know core viewing times. So to only have your Canadian stuff in the summer is just something we're not. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.